Greg. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Secretary General, for being here, for taking your time to be here. Uh, it's been a long two days, also here at the conference. A lot has happened here, but also on the Hill, as it uh, has been coined. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen the declaration yesterday evening with 79 paragraphs of substance. Yes. But we've also seen President Trump press conference today. Right. And this, title, uh, this session is titled, Where Do We Go From Here? So, looking at all these developments, where do we go from here? All right, well, let me start because I know everybody's curious what the dynamics have been with, with President Trump uh, over the last uh, 24, 48 hours. And so let me, let me start with that because I have to tell you that I've seen um, several aspects of the president that uh, are uh, frankly very valuable for driving forward the agenda here at NATO. One aspect we all know about, and that is his hard-driving attitude to defense burden sharing, and that was very much on display. We heard about it yesterday, we heard about it today, but I'll tell you, it led to a very deep and intense discussion around the table about how the alliance needs to intensify its efforts to fulfill its commitments to defense spending, defense burden sharing. And so, in fact, what you're seeing and Sekjen talked about it earlier today in his press uh, uh, encounters, a couple of them. What you're seeing is that the Allies are redoubling their efforts. And Trump's leadership has already shown results in terms of $41 billion in new monies for 2017 and 2018. So we need to redouble our efforts, and all of the Allies conveyed that notion very clearly. So there was that leadership from the president and that aspect. But I wanted to just talk for a moment about another aspect that I saw that was very interesting to me. I think some of you may have seen on the press the uh, ceremony that we had out front where the flags are. And it was a good ceremony. The soldiers were there. We played the NATO hymn, which is a kind of lugubrious piece of music, but I still like it. It's, you know, it always gives me a little flutter here in the heart. But anyway, it was great because the fellow who had written that hymn was there and he actually directed it. And after the presidents were finished on their podium, President Trump walked over and he shook that man's hand and he wanted to have his picture taken with him. And so another thing that I saw this time was uh, Trump the politician, you know, really trying to connect with NATO. And I thought that was pretty neat. And I hope, frankly, that we'll see more of that from the president because uh, he really connected with the band yesterday, but he also really connected with the leaders around the table. And it's not only at NATO that he connects with them, obviously. He's, going, he's already in London now to meet with uh, counterparts in the UK government with Prime Minister May. Of course, he will be meeting with the Queen. And, uh, but it's, uh, it was just neat for me to see how he actually can connect with people as a politician, he did that in a simple way with our band, but he also did it, I think, in a very intense way around the NAC table, and that leadership is very, very important going forward. All right, thank you. Um, before we get into more of, of, of a conversation, I would like to um, invite the audience to use the app and go into the app for asking questions. Your questions will be put on the screen, and. We'll later come to you for the questions. And um, but Rose, I was actually wondering. Um, there has been a lot of media coverage on indeed what President Trump has said, but there has been also so much on new initiatives such as the NATO readiness yeah. initiative, uh, troop commitments to Afghanistan in and Iraq. Right. But the media headlines have been have been about Trump. So if I have to tell my friends or my family, you know, what have you seen about the NATO summit? They will tell me, I've yeah. heard great statements of, of Trump. That's great, that's a great way. How do we reach actually, the big audience? Can I do this? I actually want to challenge the audience. So I'd like to hear from you what you think is the biggest takeaway in substantive terms. I don't want to hear again about, about burden sharing. What really struck you, I'll give you my three examples. One is what I call um, the big arc that goes from Wales to Warsaw to Brussels. 
And that big arc, I think about it as an arc of effectiveness because when we confronted the crises of 2014, the seizure of Crimea, destabilization of the Western Donbass, when we uh, encountered the seizure of Mosul and the rise of Daesh, we were facing serious problems of deterrence and defense and fighting terrorism. And so the alliance seized those challenges and between Wales to Warsaw, we came up with the battle groups, put in place the battle groups for deterrence and defense. And between, uh, I'm sorry, between Wales and Warsaw, we began the process. Warsaw, we took it forward with the battle groups, put in place the, the deterrence and defense capability in the Baltic states and Poland. And this time we are talking all about what we need to do to effectively reinforce and rapidly reinforce behind those tripwires in the Baltic states and Poland. And so to me, we are showing that NATO delivers in terms of military effectiveness. That's one thing I wanted to mention. But the other really, I think, more, um, I would say singular accomplishments are things that uh, this alliance does well, but they don't often get a lot of notice. One, I refer you to the action plan on 1325 Women, Peace and Security. And I hope you'll take the chance to go to our exhibit where we've got the interactive map and play with it some. I hope some of you had a chance already. I'm going right after this session to, uh, to do a walkthrough and play with it myself. But it shows that NATO is really beginning to focus on these issues as never before. And now we have an action plan that's going to drive us in that direction. So that's very, very important. And then the other one that is my personal favorite, I just came, oh, oh gosh, it was about an hour ago from the ceremony where Sekgen signed the letter inviting the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia to accession talks. And knowing how hard our friends and colleagues in Athens worked and how hard our friends and colleagues in Skopje worked to make that happen, I was absolutely thrilled, as was every person in that room. So our door is open. We've said that time and time again. But taking away from this summit, you can see that we have not only an open door, but an active project moving forward. So those are my two favorites. I'd like to hear from the audience what your favorites are. And of course, I'll try to answer questions too. Okay, uh, Deputy Secretary General, we just had the President of Afghanistan here on stage. Mm -hmm. And the Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan is in the declaration. There have been troop commitments uh, by the UK, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Uh, how do you see the future of NATO in Afghanistan five years from now, 10 years from now? Well, five years from now is easy because one of the great things about uh, the decisions in this uh, summit, um, the decision to extend our support to the Resolute Support Mission to 2024. So that is there as a very clear and firm decision. Not every NATO uh, ally found it easy to make that decision because of budget problems and issues they had to deal with back in their capitals, but every single NATO ally has committed to maintain support for the Resolute Support mission until 2024. So that, I think, is, is an easy one. As for 10 years out, I hope 10 years from now, Afghanistan is in a very different place. And I think what you heard from um, President Ghani probably conveyed very clearly that his vision for Afghanistan will take it to a very different place uh, within 10 years. And you just mentioned commitment uh, within the NATO alliance. One of the big, bigger commitments is the NATO readiness initiative, but also that brings NATO closer to home, or the, ch the challenges closer to home. That tied in with the initiatives in military mobility, the initiatives ha that have been taken uh, on uh, EU defense. How do you see this developing in sync with each other, and how will this play out? Well, I was talking a moment ago about the reinforcement initiative. I think it's very easy um, to think about it as a way to get um, the, the alliance moving faster. Because frankly, what has happened in the past is we said, okay, we have a certain le level of readiness, maybe it takes 60 days to be ready to move. Well, what this initiative does, it says it's not only it's 30 days now, but it's 30 days to be ready to employ. That means already in theater and if necessary, ready to go. That's a big, big 
difference. And so what the reinforcement initiative is all about is readiness, actually, and making sure that our forces are not only uh, capable, but also ready and can move quickly. And here's where we get into the cooperation with the European Union, which is another big part of this summit meeting, what we have done to reinforce and uh, strengthen that cooperation since Warsaw is considerable. And what's very, very interesting is, of course, for the European Union, they have other responsibilities. They're all about improving the, the conditions for commerce, making sure the roads, rail networks, ports, and et cetera, are ready for, uh, for commerce. But they are working with us to put in place also the kinds of requirements that we have to make sure they'd also be capable of, of uh, bearing up heavy equipment, for example, tanks and other kinds of heavy equipment. So, but I like to say that even there, you know, when you think of the demands of, of hev heavy truck traffic for commercial purposes, you know, those requirements are not so different. So it's good that we have, I would say, a kind of coming together of what our, uh, what our needs are between the European uh, Union and NATO on military mobility. The Dutch, by the way, have been absolutely fantastic at leading the way and really helping to craft this cooperation uh, with the European Union in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's time to move to the audience because, like you said, you like to hear from hear the from audience. You. I don't know. Can we put the questions up on the screen already? Yes. So let's see if we can pick some. Um, maybe we haven't really touched on hybrid and cyber. Okay. Um, how does that tie in with the readiness initiatives? Maybe you can say something about this. Well. Um, Frankly, hybrid and cyber challenges, um, they, you know, it's a kind of, it's interesting because hybrid threats are, as we like to say, as old as the Trojan horse. Uh, so they're not really new in military terms, but the nature of them has changed so incredibly in the last, uh, even since the Warsaw Summit, we've seen them taking new shape, and really uh, starting to be a day in, day out challenge to the Alliance dealing with uh, cyber attacks, dealing with disinformation that is generated off often through uh, social media and the use of social media, bot-generated propaganda, for example. So we have had to uh, really think hard about this in the last, uh, in the last uh, period since I've been here at NATO, a year and a half, and look at ways to, uh, to really wrestle with this problem. I think there are a couple ways we're thinking about it. First of all, and you may have heard this in the last couple of days, building up the resilience of the alliance, all uh, alliance members, but also our partners, resilience to be able to deal with cyber attacks, for example, resilience to be able to uh, address the stratcom challenges that come with, uh, with, uh, with bot-generated propaganda, with, uh, with that kind of, of constant flow of misinformation through your society. So there's, uh, there's a lot that the Alliance is doing in that area, but again, I challenge this audience to help us think through, and it's one area we will be focusing on quite a bit, the challenges of deterring, deterring in this space, hybrid, asymmetric threats, and they are different according to the different nature of the threat. So I challenge you to help us think this through as well. That will be one of the main areas that we are, uh, I think, working hard on. It's, and it's, it's somewhat new since Warsaw. I mean, it, it wasn't new at Warsaw. Again, let's think way back into history, but it's really uh, grown in its uh, impact on the Alliance in, in recent years. I think one of the big topics I see, at least on the screen, is one question from someone anonymous on the metric of 2% in burden sharing, and someone else I saw on the screen asked, uh, is the burden sharing fair as it is uh, uh, measured at this point? How have these discussions taken place during the summit? Well, I uh, will underscore that uh, what we talked about at, uh, as the Defense Investment Pledge has three parts to it. It's cash, capabilities, and contributions. And so there is a pretty spirited debate across the Alliance about how exactly you fold uh, you know, those three things together to give an ad adequate picture of what each ally uh, is putting on the table for, uh, for NATO. And so um, we try to be really rigorous with this. And uh, Secretary General, 
Stoltenberg uh, he was former fi finance minister and also educated in this uh, arena of care careful statistics. I mean, that was part of his, his uh, education. He really drills down hard on the numbers and what the numbers mean and tries to put them together. We, on his behalf, of course, so we have a great staff doing this. But we try to be very consistent about how we approach it. And then we end up having debates about you know how to count things. But that goes with any kind of statistics. But I refer you to the Secretary General's annual report and to the defense budget numbers that were just published a few days ago. It's something you can take a look at and, uh, and really start to, to try to digest how we handle this problem. There was a good question by Ulrike Franke uh, on this uh, list. I don't know if you can show it. It was about um, Europe's... Um, responsibility to be able to mil uh, to act militarily, but I don't know if that can be put up. Can you give your microphone? Sorry, uh, just very quickly, because we talk so much about input to 2%, but what, it, what is it that we actually would expect the Europeans to be able to do? What's the output that they would, we would like to, to see? Because 2% don't really solve anything. Well, that's why we try to have this more sophisticated consideration of cash capabilities and contributions, so. Okay, um, is there another question on there? Yes, maybe um, leading up to that, um, the outlook for the contributions for the 30, 30. 30 th that's um, actually uh, the very interesting. I, I, have you talked about this at all in the last couple of days, um, what exactly it no. is? Okay, well, let me just, oh, Celeste is nodding, so. He, oh, General Scaparotti talked about it. So there's a couple points I'd like to emphasize about it. Uh, these are uh, 30 battalions, uh, 30 uh, air squadrons, and 30 ships ready in 30 days to employ. Um, what I want to stress, uh, because I've had some confusion from various audiences, it won't surprise you, I've been talking to the Russian media about this. This is not number one to bring forward for permanent deployment in Europe. This is a reinforcement capability. So if there is a crisis, if there is a conflict, if there is necessity to reinforce our battle groups, that is when these capabilities would come into play and they are not to be in any sense permanently deployed in Europe. The other thing I think it's very good to focus on is that they are not new forces. They are forces that all of the allies have available, but uh, they perhaps haven't brought them up to the level of readiness uh, that needs to happen. So this is meant to spread, this 30-30-30 initiative is meant to spread a culture of readiness and the notion that that readiness must go with the capability to rapidly reinforce across the alliance to every alliance member and to make sure that everybody is stepping up to the bar on this. So that's the second uh, point I want to make about it in general. But in terms of um, you know, contributions, if it's actually going to happen, I think the, uh, the prognosis is very good. We haven't had a formal, you know, uh, generation, force generation, yet, as far as uh, I understand, but uh, from what I hear across the alliance, people are very ready to do this. So we'll see when the first formal force generation goes out, uh, what happens, but there's been a very, very good reaction to this uh, initiative, to this proposal. And by the way, it was one that was first developed in the think tank community in the United States, so for those of you in the audience who might have been involved in helping us to think it through, I can say thank you. Um, maybe we give the audience a chance, we don't have the app, to also ask some questions. There are some people with mics uh, up here, the, the gentleman up front here. Uh, I'm Khalid Amit Farooqi from Geo Television News, Pakistan. I covered Afghanistan for 23 years, mm -hmm. right in the war, first war as well. Uh, right from the beginning, it's 70, 17 years now, Americans did not listen about Afghanistan uh, to his neighbors. Neighbors are very vital, but American diplomacy have been to ignore Iran, Pakistan, particularly regarding Afghanistan. And what we see that now with the South Asian uh, strategy of President Trump doing the same, that isolating more neighbors and uh, basically involving 
more countries which are not neighbor to Afghanistan. Do you think, will it produce next in 10 years any result if Afghanistan and Pakistan are not on board? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Um, first of all, I want to be clear to everybody around the room, I, I have an American accent. I was an American official, but I'm now the Deputy Secretary General of, of NATO, so I'm not engaged or involved in, in U.S. policymaking in this area at the moment, so I do want to underline that. But um, my memory is, um, when I was in government, that there was quite a bit of engagement with Pakistan to try to work the issues in Afghanistan. And that continues, as far as I can tell. Uh, we just uh, completed an RSM meeting today, and that's the second part of my answer. Around that table, there were many, many partners. The allies were there, of course, but there were many, many uh, partners as well, including regional partners. So. As far as I can see, at least from the perspective of NATO's RSM uh, training mission in Afghanistan, we do try to be as inclusive as possible and take into account uh, the, the kinds of contributions that, uh, that partners can make fully as well. And the fact that we now have this continued commitment out to 2024, we are urging our partners as well to step up to that and to be willing to continue to join us in, the, in this effort. So. Um, it's, uh, well, in other words, I, I, I'm not completely agreeing with the hypothesis behind your question, but, but I take the point that it's important to engage regionally, and, uh, and I also take the point that we could do better, because I think we could do better. Yes, the gentleman here up front. Microphone yes, here. here. Uh, hello, this is Wakar from NATO Association of Canada. Uh, if I would talk about the plus points of the summit, I would talk for two days. Uh -huh. So I would just What's like your favorite? There, <laughs> so there is just one little comment which I would want to make, and I would want to invite your comment on that. Um, since we are talking about inclusivity, uh, I would I have not seen any differently able person here. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, say that. Again. I mean, differently able person. Uh, I mean, I have not seen any person on the wheelchair. I mean, we are talking about everyone. So maybe we can expand the questions from. Uh, I mean, you guys focused a lot on the gender equality uh, or the feminism, but I think the questions, and then we discussed the questions of race, like we should talk about that. But even though like the, we had many people here, but I have not heard even anyone talking about that. So maybe in the next summit, if, uh, because we're talking about everyone, so do you think like all voices should be heard and that's important? Uh, the question, the other question is, uh, I would want to invite your perspective on that. Do you think the war in Afghanistan and, uh, I mean, the war on terror was imposed on Pakistan and Afghanistan? Thank you. Well, we are talking about um, a consequence of 9-11 and Article 5 being declared. Uh, but again, uh, from the perspective, and, and I've just come from a global coalition meeting, so we've had a lot of meetings today, RSM and uh, Global Coalition meeting, in which we were talking about the defeat of Daesh. And uh, everyone recognizes that we have made significant progress and really uh, done so much. Uh, there was a map shown of, you know, the continuing, there are some continued pockets of, of presence in Iraq of Daesh, but we must, and this was clear, uh, resolve around the table, we must continue to, to, to finish this job. But a sense, too, that we have uh, made some extraordinary progress in, in this effort. And everyone around the table, from the region, the allies, the partners, agreed that it was necessary to defeat this extremist organization that has been at the heart of so much terrorism, so much destabilization for all, all our countries. So the way I see it, the way I, I, I see uh, the question you're raising is that uh, when we are able to uh, defeat terrorism and, uh, and you know, really uh, have some decisive effect in that regard, then that's when societies can begin to, to resume uh, their prosperity, their health, their security, their stability, all those things that allow a country to, uh, to prosper. So again, we talked about Afghanistan a moment ago. I hope in 10 years, Afghanistan will be there. Your first question is, is really, really interesting 
because um, our policy, and I, I was, I guess, not telling the complete story, we're also focused on civil civilians in armed conflict. And that means everybody. So we do try to focus on the challenges uh, facing civilians in armed conflict. It tends to focus often on children and, and what happens to them in armed conflict, but it is everybody. It's men, women, and children. And so if somehow we've given the impression by focusing so much on 1325 that we don't care about anything else, that's not true at all. And in fact, we have new policies in that area. Now we have to implement those policies. That's the challenge. Exactly. Um, we have time for two short, brief questions, so please keep it brief. The gentleman here and the gentleman there in the back. There. Hello. Hi. It's wonderful to see you, Micha Baranowski, GMF, a Warsaw director. Uh -huh. So I wanted to ask you about Alliance Unity after this summit. I agree with a lot of the, the strong deliverables that, that the summit um, has brought forward. But this morning when we were sitting here, I think a lot of us had a, a bit of a near-death experience when it comes to NATO when um, not correct uh, reports about um, President Trump talking about pulling out of NATO came um, to, to, the, to the room. So my question is your assessment of the alliance unity after this summit, um, being in a position of Deputy Secretary, what should we do going forward uh, to strengthen uh, the, 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 the unity? And um, yeah, I mean, tell us a little bit about the political angle. Um, oh, well, I guess one, one thing that we really carefully observed this morning was whether the, the drama um, um, and the uh, emergency NAC meeting produced additional results when it, came, when it comes to the speed, for example, of coming closer to the 2%. Okay. Thanks. Let's take both of them at the same time. All right, that's fine. The gentleman over there. Thank you very much. Uh, Sebastian Sprenger with Defense News. I do want to revisit the issue of funding one more time, and perhaps you can close the, sort of close the book for us on this. You mentioned that $41 billion is, in fact, uh, 2017 and 2018 money. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of been, been on the books. Um, has there, Since are we President going, Trump came into office, that's, yeah. that's the calculation. Okay. Are we going away from the summit? Has, have the metrics changed at all in terms of the two percent on quantity and 2024 in terms of timeline has this at all changed thank you okay thank you um but let me take your question first because the two kind of fit together um i mentioned a moment ago that um, these leaders get together a lot they see each other in multiple settings and what struck me uh about the the group dynamics in the nato setting is these are people who know how to talk to each other. And they talk very directly. I mean, people threw away their talking points, which was good. It was the right thing to do. They needed to talk to each other about intensifying commitments, intensifying the commitment to achieve what has been promised. And what I saw in that room was a certain, um, I would say, you know, butting of heads. There's no question about it. President Trump has very strong views on this, but different allies have very strong views on this as well. And so they got it all out on the table. They talked to each other very, very directly. But I have to tell you, to me, that's what good leaders do. They don't mince words with each other when they need to come to an agreement. And what came out of that NAC this morning was a very, I would say, clear view that the allies are together in redoubling their commitments, in moving forward, and that President Trump has really pushed people hard to intensify their efforts. So there was a certain sense that, you know, the president um, had, had, really, had really helped to, to intensify efforts inside the alliance. So, but I, I want to convey to you that this is, you know, this is part of the give and take that good leaders have, that they speak up for the interests of their countries, they speak up very articulately, very tough, they bring their own facts to bear on the debate, 
But what's wrong with a good debate? That's what happens around the NAC table every single day of the week. What's wrong with a good debate? What's the big deal here? You know, honestly. So let's focus on the substance. In answer to your question, we are committed to what we have agreed, and we will continue to work now from this headquarters, Jens Stoltenberg and I, will have a lot to do in order to make sure that everybody keeps their eye on the prize, this intensification of effort. And that is what I think President Trump brought to Brussels, and that's what he's taking away, that he got the allies to really step up to these commitments, and that is a big deliverable. So thank you very much. You can tell I feel strongly about this because we, I said it the first day when I came to talk to you, we have so much substance. Those 78 paragraphs are full of good stuff. So I do ask you to take a good look at them because you will see there the future of the alliance laid out for you. And let's not get wrapped around the axle about debates that are natural among good leaders. Thank you all. Very that good. Note. Thank you so much, Thank Thank Secretary you. General. Thank you. I'd like to invite Nick, Mr. Gowing. Beautiful. Rose, can I just, uh, the ambassador's going to join uh, us in a moment, but can I just ask as you leave, because it's now, what, 36 hours since we stood here right yeah. at the beginning about, it's only that, uh, what is normal about the new normal? A gathering like this, which you wanted, what does it achieve for you as Deputy Secretary General? Oh, I wish I could have been here more because I was watching, you know, on the screens as I was running from one end to the other of the, of the new headquarters. I was watching on the screens and it really looked like a lot of good discussion and debate were going on here as well. So I hope you have all found this to be a worthwhile effort. Good, good. And um, I have to say, the first time I had one of these microphones put on me and I was sent out into the middle of the floor at the Brussels Forum, I was absolutely petrified. But I have to tell you, I'm beginning to like the format more than a, than a static uh, panel, so maybe we should be doing more of them. Anyway, thank you all very, very much. I do appreciate your being here today, and, and thanks for your tough questions and the good discussion. You can be the moderator next time as well. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> nice to see you, Rose. All Bye -bye. the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>